thank you for coming to this performance of Heartfelt Voices United, Voices from the Soul, written and directed by me. Um, this performance is a story from perspective of victims, from victim to empowered survivors. And it is a journey. I have here today the two mayoral candidates, and the reason that I have asked them here today is because the purpose of this whole theater performance is to create a dialogue about violence against women. We need to start talking about it, and we need to do it together. To me, it is a bipartisan issue. It is an issue that affects everybody in all walks of life. And so I have asked both candidates here today to talk about their, if they become mayor, what their plans are to help eradicate violence against women, or what they're gonna start doing to head ahead in that direction. And I'm going to start the, today, it's, uh, we have City Councilman Carl DeMaio, and we have Congressman Bob Filner, and I'm going to start with, um, we're going to introduce, but I'm going to give them uh, a chance here. We will start with the, the councilman and then do the congressman, and then I'm going to ask one question. I do not want a free-for-all, and they get to answer, and then they can be on their way, okay? Um, or hang out and visit, whatever. So, what I want to do is I want to start out with city councilman Carl DeMaio. stretches there. There we go. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. This is such an important issue, and it's an issue where local government has the biggest responsibility uh, to protect all members of our community, uh, particularly women against domestic violence and other forms of abuse. Uh, this is something important to me. As a child growing up in a home, watching my mother abused by my father, and it's frightening. And there's a shame and a stigma associated with this sort of violence. And unfortunately, there is a uh, pattern of the victims sometimes protecting uh, their uh, violent spouse or uh, boyfriend or whomever, covering it up. And so I think that this is an issue that we ought to talk about and bring to the forefront. And I think that the program, Heartfelt, by utilizing drama and bringing this into the conversation, absolutely is a nonprofit, is a program that we ought to embrace. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're doing what you're doing and our city's stronger as a result. But we have to do more in terms of enforcement as well, which is why I support an expansion of our police uh, programming. Uh, our five-year staffing plan to add police officers so that we can respond appropriately and that we can investigate and we can put the resources there for enforcement. We also have to continue to support our Domestic Violence Center, uh, which is a national model in the city of San Diego uh, where we have a one-stop shop of service providers, enforcement, uh, uh, victim support. We need to make sure that this program continues and is expanded. And of course, my approach to community service partnerships, uh, my San Diego service plan talks about our, uh, how we can do this. Um, and then I would also say that we're not just talking about violence against women. You need a mayor who respects women. You need a mayor who sets that tone. And you need a mayor who's going to insist on zero tolerance when it comes to the issue of sexual harassment uh, in the workplace and in any other environment. That is absolutely critical. And I'm proud of the fact that that is the approach I've taken in my companies that I've built, the approach I've taken in my office, a zero tolerance policy. Because there is a hostile work environment all too often, and it includes in government. Uh, it includes elected officials who mistreat women. Uh, and when you have that sort of pattern of behavior, it is something that we ought to stand up and say, absolutely not. Our elected officials should reflect the best, the best in our community. 
And so I think that's very important that we have a mayor who can demonstrate zero tolerance in the administration, zero tolerance in every government agency, uh, a clear pattern of respecting women uh, and creating an environment where we affirm. So I'm looking forward to uh, tackling this issue with your help. You're obviously very interested because you're willing to come on a hot day. Uh, and obviously we're, we're supportive of heartfelt voices. Uh, but I would appreciate your continued leadership and focus on these issues uh, so that in San Diego we can tackle this, this problem and make the city an even greater model beyond just the domestic violence center that we have. That's why I'm running for mayor and that's why I would appreciate your support. And now, I'm going to introduce Congressman Bob Filner and his speech. Thank you. Good afternoon. And, uh, I know we're expecting a performance, but we're not it, I don't think. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a, a pretty clear difference in this election. You have a one-term councilman and someone who's been involved in, in uh, government and politics for three decades, uh, from the school board to the city council to Congress. Uh, Carl, is the first time in four years I've ever heard you talking about this issue uh, and all the programs that he said he supports, he voted against on the council. I mean, it was no, 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 against war police, against the, uh, the uh, Violence Against Women office. I mean, you voted against all these things and now suddenly you're in mayor and you're for it. Bob, you know that's let, let me, uh, uh, did I interrupt you? Did I interrupt you, Mr. Uh, DeMaio? Did I interrupt you? Did I interrupt you? Uh, again, I, when you when you have a third party verification of things, I think that's the best way to figure out what we're all doing. Now you know there are various groups that have ranked uh, candidates on the basis of their uh, policies and their votes on women's issues. Not all focus on the ones you're focusing on here, on domestic violence and abuse. But whether you're talking about the National Organization for Women, whether you're talking about NARA, whether you're talking about Planned Parenthood, I have 100% over 30 years record, 100% voting on the issues that are important to women. And those organizations have endorsed me in this election. So it doesn't matter what I say, it matters what the women's groups say about who is the candidate that is best attuned and best positioned and has the strongest history of concern on these issues. Let me talk about one specific aspect of what you're dealing with, Karen. Suzanne, Suzanne, I'm sorry. Uh, many of you know I, I, I've served on the uh, Veterans Committee to Congress for 20 years. I was the chairman for four years. And I was the one who highlighted two basic issues that we have got to do better on. One is, of course, sexual uh, trauma in the military. A, as you point out, as you point out uh, that the silence on these issues is the thing we have to break through the most. And when you have two-thirds of our active duty military women subject to sexual trauma, and then faced with the good old boys protecting them, protecting themselves, and then the victim becomes the person charged with the crime. And the silence about that because of fear and uh, you know, no promotions, we're finally breaking through. There's some recent film that uh, really went into that in a really heartrending way, but we have to break through that culture in the military which subjects women. We praise the women who have volunteered to fight in our armed forces, and yet when two-thirds of them are subject to sexual trauma, something is wrong. And I was the one who held hearings and started focusing on these issues. In addition, when the women get out of the armed services, and try to go to the Veterans Administration hospitals, what do they find? A men's institution. It's been there for you know, decades and decades and decades, and we have not changed the culture. I've walked in there with women. They are subject to cat calls. There is no privacy kind of changing rooms in many of the hospitals. There is no, if they happen to have, bring a child or children that they have to take care of and couldn't find a babysitter, the doctors will not see them. Uh, a doctor, there are not very many women doctors in the VA. Uh, 
a doctor may see a woman that she described to me with an arm blown off, which she got in combat in Fallujah, in Iraq. And the guy thought it was cancer or something. He couldn't imagine a woman you know, having a combat wound here in the Veterans Administration Hospital at a time when we are urging women to join the combat forces. So we have to change the culture there. And that's what I've been trying to do. I wrote a Bill of Rights for Women Veterans, which was passed by the House. The Senate did not act on it. Which said that the things that I just outlined cannot happen in the Veterans Administration. That we post a Bill of Rights right on the door. That the, the structure of the, uh, of the VA has to change to meet those needs, whether it's women doctors or, structure, or physical changes in the, for changing rooms, for example, or child care uh, in all the hospitals. We have got to change it. And I've led the way. This is not just seeing an issue and talking about it because there's a mayor's race. I started my career uh, fighting for civil rights in the civil rights movement, working with Dr. King and others being a freedom writer, spending time in jail, coming out of that with seeing the, that we can make change in America if you can get together. Uh, we brought down the whole legal structure of segregation in the court decisions uh, which overturned my own conviction. Women, women's rights, the violence against women, the abuse of women is a civil right that we have to work on more and more and more. The culture, as you know, has to be changed. That change comes from working from the bottom, as you are doing. It comes from the top. A mayor who understands those issues, has been involved in those issues, has taken action on those issues for decades and decades. Thank you. Okay, I didn't tell either one of you what the question was going to be. <laughs> but this is the project with which many of the funds go to that people pay when they come in the store. And that is why this question. To let you know that in the United States, there are close to 100,000 rape kits that have been collected, that have been placed in storage facilities and not acted upon. There is close to 100,000 in backlog. At this point, there is a certain amount in San Diego. As mayor, what would your plan be if you found out that there was a backlog? In Los Angeles, there was 10,000. So I would imagine there probably is a backlog here in San Diego. I do not know the number, because I have not been able to find that out. If you were mayor and you found out that there was a backlog of great kids, what would you do to try to help people trying to uh, to get that backlog cleared up and fresh? I'm going to start with you, Congressman Hilmer. Well, most of these questions end up uh, in two, if two areas. One, leadership. Leadership at the top from the mayor's office who says this is an important thing that we have to deal with and then getting the funding, of course, for them. Uh, now, we know that there are funding issues in the city of San Diego, but I will tell you, the funding issues are more, right now have more to do with the prioritization of those funds than anything else. Uh, that is, the funds are there if we use them differently. And so, we could use the funds to, to uh, clear up the backlog. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Number one. Our so-called Center City Development Corporation, CCDC, was just abolished. I think I would have abolished it as a mayor if the governor and the courts hadn't done it. They were getting about $200 million a year of our tax, $200 million per year of our tax money for redevelopment of downtown. Now, I used to be the councilman for downtown. I pushed through the gas lamp plant. We know that redevelopment downtown was necessary and has a lot of it's been accomplished. But you don't need public subsidy now. What we have is a lot of private developers, most of whom support Mr. DeMaio, who are looking for a public subsidy. What, happened to, what happens to our neighborhoods? What happens to these kind of services that women, children, seniors need? I want, what my candidacy represents is a shift in those priorities. Mr. DeMaio just led a, a, 
a council decision which said to the hotel owners of this city, most, you know, the Hiltons, the Marriotts, they're not, they don't even live in San Diego. They're multinational corporations. He and the council gave them the right to vote on whether there should be an increase in the hotel tax. The hotel tax is a, uh, we, most of us don't pay it, it's from tourists, but it's a public tax. Why should a private group decide have the right to tax it? It's just like people walking by here and you decide to tax them a nickel every time they went by. You can't do that. That's a public vote. And then that's, and the couple percent of increase is say worth, I don't know, close to $30 million. They got the right to decide how that money is going to be used. That's public money. So a private group decided there should be a tax rather than a public vote. And it went to private people as opposed to the public purse. Now, we can, I could talk all afternoon about misappropriation of the funds. That is, I, I would say, I should say, a different priority of funds. But here's two big ways. Let's get some of the, let's get that tax increment money into our neighborhoods and into the services that need it. Let's not give the private hoteliers who support uh, Mr. DeMaio and put that into the public system. The biggest change uh, in this city in 50 or 60 years will be if I'm elected mayor. That is, the downtown group, let's call them the good old boys, because this is a good group to call them, have controlled government for that law. They all support Carl. If we wanted to change it, you're going to have to vote for Bob Flynn. And City Councilman Carl DeMott. Thank you. How, how to respond to all of that uh, in such a short period of time. First, let's start with the important issue that was posed. There is a backlog uh, of these cases, the DNA uh, kits, the rape kits that we have to analyze. The quicker we get those uh, kits evaluated, the quicker that information can be put into our database and our police officers will be able to use that for enforcement. That's why this has to be a priority. I've already met with Sheriff Bill Gore. We've talked about the Sheriff's Crime Lab and the City's Crime Lab and how we do have backlogs on both sides that we can address if we start working together and using the specialization of both sides to prioritize cases. Second, it does take funding. That is why I have led a reform movement in San Diego. Not because of the politicians or the labor unions that support Mr. Filner and the downtown insiders who actually opposed our reform agenda, who put forward a huge tax increase on working families, Prop D, huge tax increase with no guarantees it would go to public safety no guarantees that it would go to community programs. No, it was a blank check, and Mr. Filner supported it. And we said no, and guess what? The people sided with our position and said we need reform first. And then we laid out our reform agenda. Our pension payment, you talk about where the money goes. Our pension payment went from $48 million in the year 2000 to $232 million this year. City employees can retire as early as age 50. Early as age 50. And they're getting these six-figure payouts. Many of them are getting higher pensions than their highest salary. It's absolutely outrageous that our tax dollars went from $48 million on a pension payment to $232 million. And every time... That's a lie, and you know it. Every single time no, no employee that we a, had... Retired age 50 with a six-figure Thank you, Bob. That's a lie. All right, thank you. Every single dollar of that increased pension payment came from our neighborhood services, our public safety programs, our libraries, the list goes on and on. A fraction of it would fully fund our solution on the backlog. And it's just so fundamental that we have to have a mayor who's gonna make this a priority and has the ability to find the money, reform our city bureaucracy, and we're on a roll. Each and every one of our reforms have been supported by Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. And each and every one of these reforms that have passed overwhelmingly, including in this district, have been opposed by Mr. Filner. He talks about changing the people at the table and the people in charge. Well, he, he's supported by the very people who dominated the city and opposed the fiscal reforms, who said there was no fiscal crisis, who said there was no pension reform that was needed. So you want to talk about change. You want to talk about change. It's time that the people's reform agenda is implemented by a reform-minded mayor. And Mr. Filner has fought that agenda that the people have driven every step of the way. He would undo all of those reforms and monies that would go to dealing with the backlog and the approach of working with our sheriff in a collaborative way. No, 
That doesn't happen with Bob Filner as mayor. It will happen with Carl DeMaio as mayor. And you will always get an answer that is honest and backed up by facts, which is why I must go back to the issue where Mr. Filner says I voted against all these programs. It simply is not true. Mr. Filner has a pattern of making reckless accusations that are then uncovered by the media and he's called out. They actually have called it out as a lie. It's very rare that the media, independent media, calls something a lie. Except the NBC, NBC <laughs> etc. So this is so important that you understand that you need to do some real homework on these claims. And I will end on this point. How an individual treats women in their office, in their family, in their company, in their environment, is an indicator of whether they will make domestic violence an important in public policy. My record is clear. I encourage you to examine the record of every single candidate by that measurement of whether they treat women with respect. If you evaluate your candidates on that basis, it will be quite enlightening in terms of who you can trust to set good public policy for women's issues. I thank you two for being here. Um, as I said before, I want to open a dialogue. And I don't care if it becomes a free-for-all and whatever, we, as long as we talk about violence against women and we do it without shame, together we must eradicate this. Thank you very, very much. That's a great